Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos working through the classic textbook, An Introduction to Greek by Crosby and Schaefer. In the second lesson, we will continue our discussion of the declension of O stems. Now, declension was something we got an introduction to in the first lesson through realizing that in a fully inflected language like Attic Greek, nouns will have to undergo certain adjustments of form to reflect how they are being used within the sentence. Is the noun being used as the subject or the direct object, the indirect object, etc.? What we find very different from modern American English that uh, in a fully inflected language like Attic Greek, it's not just the noun that has to undergo that sort of morphological adjustment to show case um, number, etc. Uh, it's also the modifiers of the noun, and we got a little bit of a taste of this in the first lesson when we saw that there's not just one word for the within Attic Greek as there would be within modern American English. There's really no other changes which the will undergo to show um, whether it is being used subjectively, objectively, etc. in modern American English, but um, within Greek we see these different forms of the, like o, to, to, ton, etc. Well, what we find in this lesson that is particularly of interest to us is the way that it's also the adjectives which undergo those changes. If we look at the paradigm for the just man, or in its dictionary form, if you will, um, o dikaios anthropos, we find that we need to, at this stage, list out eight different forms to show um, the four different cases and the two numbers of singular and plural to give us the kind of accord between, in this particular case, three different units of meaning. We have the definite article and the adjective and the noun all having an accord with one another through being in the same case. Now, we'll go through these forms fairly quickly in the video, but I want you to actually take out a notebook and a pencil and write these paradigms by hand. That will be the best way to interiorize this knowledge so it becomes second nature, more so I would argue than simply running your eyes over the page or over the YouTube video screen. So we'll go through these with uh, the nominative singular first, oldikaios anthropos, the just man. Next, we consider the genitive singular, tu, Dikaiu anthropu. Ah, see, all of those end in u to show that this is not only genitive, but specifically singular genitive. Next, we have the dative singular, to dikaiu anthropo. Then we have the accusative singular, ton dikaiun anthropon. Now we move on to the plural column with plural uh, nominative first, oi. Dikaioi, anthropoi. Uh, see the oi agreement among all three of those units. Next, we have the genitive plural, ton, dikaion, anthropon. Next, we have the dative plural, tois, dikaios, anthropois, with that ois ending in all three. Then finally, we have the plural accusative, tus, dikaios, anthropus. Okay, so in the next slide, we're talking really, I would argue, about the way that the rules for how cases are used in one language will not necessarily be the same as the rules for how those same cases apparently are used in another. We might think that intrinsically, the only use of the genitive case is literal possession. And because within English, we actually do have an inflected form for the genitive case of nouns, which is really like the only inflection other than um, the plural S, which you may not know, um, were actually two different S's within Old English. Um, the genitive S, like for example, dogs, the dog's collar, um, and the plural S, the dogs are hungry, um, uh, eventually became identical on the surface level, such that it's often context alone which can tell you whether you're talking about a possessive dogs or plural dogs. But in Old English, those are more clearly separated. One of these was like AS and the other was ES. So we could see that insofar as um, 
inflections still exist within modern American English. It's really only those two. But um, within Greek, the genitive case inflection need not literally refer to possession in the way that, say, dogs would have to. We can also use that to express something like the notion of the place from which, for example, uh, ton anthropon pempe apo tu potamu. Here we have uh, tu potamu following after the preposition apo, which is from, uh, to express uh, that um, somebody uh, sends the man, which we know is in the accusative case because it has that on ending for both the definite article and for anthropon, the noun, um, sends that person from out of, basically, um, the river. Okay, And because it's a notion of being sent from out of something, we can maybe use that to help us remember that's kind of like the possessive of within English. We could also say um, the color of the dog. So if that helps you remember this particular use of the genitive, uh, that's something which I would recommend you to consider. But the main point here really is just that the rules for using a case in one language need not apply to another. Another example of this is that um, we would assume that the destination of an act of movement would always have to be um, displaced into a prepositional phrase. We can't just say the man goes the city as a direct object. We would have to say the man goes to the city, making it indirect. Well, in Sanskrit, that's not the case. You would actually um, say, um, you know, nara um, nagaram gachati. The man goes the city as a direct object, with nagaram having that um ending to indicate its accusative case. Another uh, different use of cases within Sanskrit relative to English uh, is um, the use of double accusatives. We um, have the tendency in English to have the um, word said and the one person it is said to in different cases to show that one is the direct object and the other is the indirect object. Um, the horse says the word to the elephant um, clearly separates those two by having only one of them in the direct object form, as would be the case in languages like, say, French, etc. Well, in Sanskrit, you could actually have a double accusative. You could say, um, ashva, gajam, vachanam, vadati. There, both word and the one it is said to have the um ending. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you have to learn the rules for how cases are used within particular languages without simply assuming that the translation from how it might be used within English would always be the same in that destination language. Another example of the genitive used to determine the place from which something occurred, um, we could see with another preposition, ek, which in this case is more literally out of rather than just from, as would be the case with a po. And we consider some vocabulary. Many of these words you're actually probably quite familiar with through their English uh, derivatives. And we'll consider first anthropos, which of course means man. We know words like anthropology is the study of man as anthropos. Next we have the word axios, which is in fact um, the word we get um, axiom from which um, are those truths within a system of say mathematics which cannot be proven because they're self-evidently true and in fact you need axioms in a system like Euclidean geometry to avoid the dual problems of either infinite regression or circular reasoning so because these self-evident truths form the foundation of a system of knowledge which allow you to then derive many other truths um, as theorems from them. Uh, they're called axioms really to show that they're extremely worthy. They have an extremely high worth. That's what axios in Greek really means. Next we have the preposition apo, which means from or away from, which we know through many words like say apostle, also an apology. An apology is really the word from you, which uh, we today think means saying you're sorry, but uh, in uh, the context of like Socrates' apology by Plato, um, he's not saying he's sorry for anything. Rather, this is a word of defense when he's put on trial. 
Next, we have the word tikaios, which we learned earlier in this lesson means just in the sense of like justified. And we have the preposition ek um, before consonants, which changes its form to x before vowels, which means out of or from. There's many words, of course, in English um, that uh, retain this sort of form. One of many examples cited by the book itself is eclectic. Then we have elespontos, which is hellespont or the Dardanelles, um, basically a proper name. Okay. Then we have macros, which is long. We know a macron within say, the writing of the Latin language is a symbol placed above a vowel to show that it is being, being used as the long rather than short version of that vowel. We don't really have that convenience within modern English writing, which is why it's so difficult to learn the arbitrary spelling of English words. Well, within um, Latin, it's much simpler because the macron showing you it's long is, in fact, required. Then we have micros, which is small. We know macroeconomics considers like global picture of economics, whereas microeconomics considers it on a smaller scale. Just two of many examples of how these words are still used within English. And we have three words, which um, are, of course, related, but we'll consider them as separate units. So we have polemos, which is the word for war. We know polemics are controversies within modern American English. Something that is polemical is controversial, in other words. But then we have polemios, which is the word for hostile. This is then the difference between a noun for war and an adjective for that, which for an adjective for hostile, let's just say. Then we have um, oi polemioi, which is in the plural, um, the enemies, right? And we have this um, in a certain sense, perhaps following after the adjective for the hostile, because um, the ones who are hostile are the enemies. And we have um, philos, which is the word for a friend. We have many words that include this. One of many is philanthropist. But, uh, generally, they love mankind, is uh, what they're trying to get at by calling them philanthropists. All right, so we'll now move on to the translation challenge contained within this chapter. I'd recommend you to pause the video now and actually write these out by hand in the Greek characters um, in a notebook. Try to translate these sentences into English with the information on vocabulary and grammar supplied thus far within the textbook. And um, we will meet back in a moment to compare our answers. Okay, so the first sentence, tus polemius pausin. I would translate as they stop the enemies. Now, there's no explicit subject in this sentence, but we know that we should translate it as a generic they because pausin has a plural ending, kind of like how in Sanskrit um, the plural ending is anti. Well, we see something like that with that zin ending telling us um, that uh, this is third person plural. Now we know that uh, the noun contained explicitly within the sentence is not the subject who is doing the stopping or pausing because we see that us ending both at the end of polemius, which is the enemies, um, and after uh, at the end rather of the definite article the. It's tus rather than some sort of nominative form. So once again, we translate this as they stop the enemies. Second sentence, ton anthropon pempe apo tu elespontu. So here we um, have, once again, a lack of explicit subject, but we know that this should be third person singular because the conjugated verb, which, uh, by the way, is the first thing you should identify whenever translating, um, the conjugated verb, verb is pempe, which gives us a third person singular form in the present tense. And this allows us to sort out how the other nouns within the sentence should be related to each other. We see that uh, the direct object of this is ton anthropon, because that's in the singular accusative case. And we have something in the genitive case. But once again, this is not possessive genitive. This is rather following after a preposition apo to indicate the place from out of which somebody was sent. This is, in other words, nested within a prepositional phrase. And we have the third sentence, oi adelfoi, ezan mikloi. 
So here we have, um, finally, something in the nominative case, an explicit subject, oi adelfoi, um, the brothers in the plural. Um, and we also have something else in the nominative plural case agreeing with them. This is the adjective small, mikroi. See the oi ending, same for all three of those. But this is not preceding brothers, as would be the case in the example we learned in the paradigm at the very beginning of the video. Rather, this is what is called a subject complement. Ezan, which is the copula were, uh, is more like the equal sign within mathematics. It's not really an action word as verbs are mistakenly called um, when we try to give notional definitions of verbs. We say they're action words. Well, that's not really true because some verbs are simply um, functioning as an equal sign to show you that the symbol on the left-hand side and the right-hand side in this case refer to the same thing in much the same way that in mathematics, 2 plus 3 and 5 superficially are different symbols. They refer to the same location on the number line. In this case, we have a agreement then between oi adelfoi and mikroi because they all refer to the same thing. That's why they're in the same number of plural and the same case of Nominative. The fourth sentence, tus filus pempusin ek tu potamu. So here we have, they send the friends from out of the river, basically. Uh, we know that it's they who are doing it because once again we have that pempusin ending, t telling us it's plural third person. Um, the us ending tells us that uh, friends are accusative plural. And we once again have a use of the genitive tu potamu, which is not possessive, but is rather showing us the place from out of which something um, is, in this case, being sent. And we know that because it's nested within a prepositional phrase headed by the preposition ek. And the fifth sentence, o polemos en dikaios. The war was just. Once again, we have the copula um, functioning as an equal sign between Polemos and dikaios, which is why they have the same os ending. But be careful. The definite article there, o, is not os. It's not os, polemos, en dikaios. Um, the uh, form or the ending need not always be exactly the same for them to be in the same case. Because within a fully inflected language, you actually have many different forms to learn rather than a more straightforward one-to-one -one correspondence between, say, something is always in the nominative case because it ends in os. We'll find later that there's other um, possibilities, uh, but for the moment, we'll just consider these. So then we'll now move on to the sixth sentence. Oi polemioi axius strategus e cuisine. This sentence... I would translate as the enemies have worthy generals. Okay, we find that um, axius strategus are functioning as a unit in which a worthy is modifying that plural accusative direct object, uh, which is different from the ones who have them, which is the subject oi polemioi, because we have both of the oi endings there and we have um, the verb at the end. Different word order than would be the case within English, in which within English we would have the verb between the subject and object, but because this is an inflected language, that rule of word order need not apply, for word order is much more fluent within a language that can communicate like that, th things like that, through case forms. And move on to the seventh sentence. O strategos tus anthropus pempe to Adelfo. Okay, so here we have three different um, noun forms, if you will. One of them must be the nominative subject, one must be the direct object, and the other must be the indirect object, because the conjugate uh, verb, which we identify first, pempe, is sends. So we know that somebody is sending something to someone. Well, we can tell who is who in this case through the case form ending. Strategos is the general, is the one doing the sending. Uh, tus anthropus are the men who are being sent as direct objects. And to adelfo is the dative case brother to whom these are sent. Finally, the eighth sense. Oi anthropoi 
et cousin Axius Adelphus. Uh, the men have worthy brothers. Now you recognize those oi and us endings as both plural, but one nominative, the other accusative. Okay, now it's the student's turn to translate. I want you to write these out on a piece of paper, fill in the endings, and we'll meet back in the next video to cover the third lesson on the present indicative and infinitive active of omega verbs. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to more videos.